What's up everyone, Cole Caparoon here. Thank you so much for stopping by for yet another video. I appreciate each and every one of you being here and boy do we got a good one today. Now over the past 18 years of me being an artist and a producer and a mix engineer and a session guitarist and a mastering engineer, one of the things that has commonly created the most problems is lack of communication and also lack of understanding of parts of the process. So today I'm gonna go over the entire recording process from start to radio ready master. And I think you as an artist or a band will get something from this and you as a producer producer or a mix engineer or a mastering engineer or whatever, you will all get something from this, if nothing more than understanding the parts of the process and, and what separates the parts of the process and so that way you can more clearly communicate with your clients or you as an artist with your producer or with your mix engineer and uh, it will clear up a lot of confusion and, and you will save time and hopefully from saving time you will save money. And by saving time and money and letting everybody work more efficiently, you should end up with a better product. Now that's a big sell for this video, but it really has been an important part in how I've been held back throughout my career during certain projects and with certain clients is lack of communication and lack of understanding the parts of the processes. So recording process explained, let's go. So you've written your song, it's probably a smash hit. So it's time to look for a producer to produce out your song and get it ready for release to the world so your fans can adore you even more than they already do. So step number one, you should look for a producer. In my opinion, you should always work with a producer if you're ready to take this thing seriously. Finding the, a good producer, but also the right producer, is important in terms of the success of your music. So the first thing that a producer is gonna do with you is go over pre-production and arrangements. Now I'm gonna go over this from my perspective on how I handle each parts of these processes and where I define the start and the end of each part of the process. So pre-production with a singer-songwriter or with an artist, a singular artist that's using their name as their title, it usually looks like I have them come in and we do a work tape together. Now a work tape is just a vocal and an acoustic or a vocal and a piano. Just to have chord progressions, uh, tempo, melodies, and lyrics down is just a reference point. And at that point in time, we would go over the arrangements of the song. Is this turnaround after the first chorus? Is it a little too long? Is this verse a little too long? Do we need to extend the solo? Like what needs to happen? What arrangement changes need to happen within the music? Now, when I'm working with a full band, it's very much the same thing, except this process takes place usually at the rehearsal spot and with the full band. And so we will sit and the band will play through their songs, we'll make notes and go over any arrangement changes that need to happen. And the general, you know, regardless of an artist or a band, will go over the, the vibe for the song. Do you want this to sound like Garth Brooks or do you want this to sound like Metallica? <laughs> and so those conversations conversations will happen in the pre-production meetings and at the rehearsal spot or in the studio when we're recording the work tape. So the next step of the process is recording and production. So if for a singer-songwriter or an artist, this would be where we start hiring session players, we start booking studio time for session players, and we start moving towards building the actual track out for the artist. Now since it's very common for uh, session players to never be in the same session together if you're doing things separately, my job as a producer is to continually steer the ship and make sure that there's a level of cohesiveness between all the different players involved, and so that Way the finished product comes out sounding like one cohesive intentional product. Now for the band there's usually two ways that this happens and it depends on the vibe of the band and what's the appropriate approach for the production of the band. I like to record things separately as often as possible but sometimes the right move for the band is to get a whole group, the whole band in a studio together and have them play together. So that kind of dictates the approach. So we will either book a studio to record drums and then we do everything else here at my place overdub style or we'll book a studio to have the full band set up and play all together, and then we'll come back to my place and do some vocal overdubs, vocal harmonies, whatever. But those are kind of the two approaches in terms of actually recording the music. So while sometimes arrangement changes do come up during the process, in my opinion, it's important to make sure those arrangement changes happen before we start recording. So that way things run as smoothly as possible, everyone's on the same page, everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to be playing when we get in the studio. There's no confusion, there's no lack of communication, there's no wasted time in the studio, which saves you money, which keeps everything running efficiently, which 
ultimately, hopefully, gives you a better end result. Now, after all the basic recording tracks are done and all the general production is done, we're gonna move on to post-production and editing. Now, in post-production, a lot of times, this is gonna have uh, the additional auxiliary instruments. If you're doing a country or pop country, rock country thing, this might be banjo and pedal steel. If you're doing pop, this might be additional percussion, additional programming as synthesizers, just the additional stuff that the band or the artist themselves is not playing, and this would happen for for me, this happens after we track vocals. A lot of these session players, they wanna hear the finished vocal and they play around the vocal. And even me, when I'm adding additional instrumentation, I kinda of wanna hear the finished vocal so that way I can complement the vocal and never step on it. This would also be the point where any real specific production cues take place, delay throws and, and real like, you know, swirly effects and swells and cuts and all that kind of stuff kinda of happens in this post-production phase, at least in how I operate. Now after all the post-production is done, we'll usually do editing. So this is where we comp and pocket and tune the vocal. Now comping just means you've recorded a whole bunch of passes of the vocal and you're going to go through and you're going to pick line by line or word by word or even sometimes syllable by syllable the best performance of each vocal and so that way you put all these pieces together to create one vocal that is as good as it could possibly be from beginning to end. Now from there, sometimes this is necessary, sometimes it's not necessary, depends on the genre of the singer and, and like the competence of the singer, but from there I pocket the vocal and basically what pocketing means is I, was, I will go through and listen to the timing of every single syllable and make sure it's what I would like it to be. Some singers need zero of this and some singers need a little bit of help in this case. And again, this depends on the genre of the music. It, you know, the more pop and the more polished a genre is, usually the more time is spent pocketing a vocal and also tuning a vocal. Now, my personal taste is I don't like uh, an obviously tuned and polished vocal. I like some authenticity to it, but there's no right or wrong with this. It's all art and it's all whatever is important to you. But the next thing in editing would be pocketing, uh, comping, pocketing, and tuning the vocal, and then cleaning up the rest of the audio tracks. You know, the guitar has a little buzz at the end of the passage, or, you know, the cymbals ring out a little bit longer. You hear the drummer set his sticks down at the end of the take. All of these things need cleaned up and polished. And so all the audio, all the silence of every part of every track should be cut out and just generally cleaning up all of the audio so that way when you listen to it, you're not hearing anything in there that you don't want to hear. Now your pre-production and your arrangements are done. Everything's good. You've recorded all of your tracks and everything is finalized. The client has approved everything. Everything's been edited and comped and pocketed and tuned and everything's cleaned up. And then I send this to the client, whoever the client may be. Sometimes it's a label, sometimes it's the artist, sometimes it's the artist and a manager and a label and we're all working together. Now this is where the final approval needs to happen before moving on to mixing. In my opinion, this is a super critical point in the project because if things aren't accurately approved or changes happen later, it really kind of screws up the mix process. Now it's very common for the producer to not be the same person that is mixing. And so when you're delivering a production to a mix engineer, it's very important that the audio that you deliver is the final version. There are no further changes to be made. This is it. This is ready to be mixed. We're not changing anything any further. Now for me personally, when I'm both producing and mixing a project, I still treat this all the same way. Sometimes I'm producing and sending to someone else to mix. Sometimes someone else is producing and sending to me to mix. And so even if I'm doing both parts of the process, I am adamant about it remaining the same as if I was sending the production off to someone else to mix. And this helps define the processes a little bit better. This helps keep communication really clear with the client. And so that way we're not halfway through the mix and they're like, you know what we need? We need a shaker in there. I try to mitigate as much of this as humanly possible and crystal clear communication and approving the production before we move on to the mix is the most important thing in this process in my opinion. So mixing. Now generally what mixing is for those of you who don't quite understand it is you're taking all these individual instruments, your kick drum and your snare drum, your vocal, your backing vocal, your harmony, your shaker that you added. <laughs> you're taking all of these individual elements and you're balancing them with level. You're applying EQ and you know that kick drum should sound a little crisper while that bass guitar should sound a little thicker. 
and that vocal could have some more presence and stand out front. And so you're adding EQ and compression, and reverb, delay, you're balancing levels, you're writing automation so things get louder and quieter within the mix. This is what mixing is, taking all of these individual elements and applying processes to each of them that then you can bounce down to a stereo left and right track that you can then play in your car or on your headphones or on your phone. Now at this point, the goal should be for the song to sound as finished as humanly possible, as perfect as humanly possible. Waiting to fix something in mastering is not a good idea because again, we wanna separate these processes and you wanna do everything in your power to make sure each process is clearly uh, separate and defined from the next process. So we want this to be the point when the mix sounds absolutely finished. I offer several revisions included in my mix rate and most mix engineers do. You work back and forth with your mix engineer to get the song to the place where the mix engineer and you as the client are also happy and you both are happy with where it is and you both agree that it's finished sounding. If it was gonna go on the radio tomorrow, you'd be happy with that. That is the mix. Now, once the mix has been completely approved, everyone's on board, there are zero changes to be made. That's when you move into mastering. Now again, I view these processes as completely separate. I will not move on to mastering until the mix has been completely approved and I do everything in my power to make sure that that mix is completely finalized before we move on to mastering. Sometimes I'm mastering my own mixes and sometimes I'm sending out to a mastering engineer and I treat both of them exactly the same. Even if I'm mastering my own mixes, it's a separate session in Pro Tools, it's a separate day at a separate time with a different mindset and exactly the same as if I was sending my mix to a mastering engineer and they would receive it and it would be a new session on a new day with a fresh mindset. So mastering, mastering is taking that left and right mix, that stereo mix that you can play in your car and applying the final level of polish to it uh, so it's ready for mass consumption. So most people think that mastering is just things being louder. You just smashing it with a limiter and making sure it's as loud as everything else on the radio. But there's so much more to this than just making something loud. It's a very zoomed out picture. When you're mixing, you're very zoomed in and focused on individual elements. And when you're mastering, you're very zoomed out and looking at everything as a big picture. So it's the final layer of EQ, final layer of compression, final limiting. Yes, it does usually get louder than the mix was. Uh, data gets imported, you know, ISRC codes, any sort of metadata that's going to go into the song. At, usually at this point, we get embedded into the audio. And then the final print is what you would actually release. Now, you would usually always release a WAV file, WAV. Personally, when I'm mastering, I also deliver an MP3, which is the highest quality MP3. So that way, when someone specifically requests it, you have the highest quality MP3 available to you. Because it never fails. Radio stations always want MP3s. And you're going to load that master into your iTunes or whatever. And then you're going to make a new MP3 and it's probably not as high quality as the one your mastering engineer could send you. So that's all the parts of the process of recording. I hope this helped you and I hope that this helped you identify the differences between it and I hope this helps you avoid miscommunications within your project regardless of whether you're an artist or an engineer on the studio side. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell icon next to the subscribe tab, drop me a thumbs up and drop me a comment on this one and let me know if you have any thoughts or anything to add to this. I would love to hear from you. Don't forget to hit me up on Instagram at Cole Caparoon. Don't forget to check out my website, colecaparoon.com, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.